Well, good morning, Chapel Hill. So a priest, a rabbi, a nun, and a duck walk into a bar. And the bartender says, is this come some kind of joke? That's, that's, that's really it. That, it. that is the punchline. It's bad when you have to say, that was the punchline. It's... <laughs> So the Oscars are tonight. I'm a movie guy. I love movies. One of my favorite movies is A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise. And the famous scene that many people know, and it's an iconic scene, when Colonel Nathan Jessup, that's Nicholson's character. Hey, Bob, you're late again. So um, he's just, he's the former mayor. I just point that out. Um, He's committed a crime. He actually committed something called a code red, which led to the murder of, a, of a, one of the Marines. So he knows he's done something wrong, but he doesn't think it's necessarily wrong. It's one of those inconvenient things that happen. And so Tom Cruise, who plays the lawyer, has him on the stand, and he's cornering him into a checkmate. He knows Jessup wants to tell the truth, but he also knows that he can't because he would be convicted. And so he gets him into that place where he's finally got him cornered. And then Nicholson's character says, you want the truth? And he and Cruz shouts back, yeah, I want the truth. And then what does he say? The famous line, you can't handle the truth. Powerful line, right? A memorable moment, something that's often quoted. And we think, well, is there some depth to this idea? Here's the reality. There are truths that make us uncomfortable. Truths like the ones he was describing. What, what happens in times of war. In, 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 there are human situations that are challenging for us to know the depths of what goes on. But I contend that we can handle the truth, that we need the truth, that we're designed for the truth. That truth is one of the three transcendentals, beauty, goodness, and truth. And that we were designed to be sustained by them. And in fact, there's something that we find abhorrent in deceit or deception or lies. I believe we can handle the truth. And I believe that we in the church know some truths. And so I want to talk today about the truth of what it means to be on a a path to blessedness. So let's go ahead and define truth. I don't know if I can get my screen to match yours, but here's a definition of truth. Um, This is the ontological. That's a big word. I say that to impress you. The ontological definition of truth is is that which is in accordance with fact or reality. Dallas Willard used to define truth as that which you can count on. It's it's something that you can say, I can build my life on that. That's a reality that I know works. It's going to be consistent and reliable. That's what truth is aiming at. And, you know, we live in the air capital. Many of you, I, I know, work in some form in the air industry and I'm guessing most everyone here has been on a plane but I I love flight and I just find it particularly interesting studying the history of flight so in in the in the effort of trying to talk about truth in terms of flight um, I want to share a video I'll sit down and sort of narrate what's going on Uh, but this is a, a video that shows footage of early attempts at flight so this guy Uh, He thought this would work. It didn't. And then they thought, I don't know what they were thinking about. This goes really fast, and it it didn't work. This one, I thought, you know, had a little merit to it because it looks like a bird, and birds fly. So if we can just imitate that, then we'll... It doesn't work, actually. Now, this is just scary. I don't know what... He bails, which is what you would do. And this is just absurd. I don't know (laughs) what he's thinking about. You know, how about if a a symbol goes really fast? Oh, this is pretty misguided. I mean, they're getting closer at this point. They didn't calculate well and didn't understand a lot of the physics, but we got a little bit. Now, this fella here, this is going to go badly, guys. (laughs) He's going to attempt. He's ready. He's saluted. And here we go. Boom and <laughs> buttocks are on fire. That's not the... And then he tries again. I don't know why he tried again. And that... 
That didn't work either. Now we're getting closer now. The, they had begun to understand a little bit more of the science of flight, but still hadn't calculated too well. And then finally here we get uh, the prototype for what would be the Wright brothers. And they're getting closer now. Didn't go too far, but they were able to get some bit of it. Now, why? Well, <laughs> this is a church. What am I talking about? <laughs> flight. Well, because there is truth in, in physics and how planes actually work. And it would take them some time to figure it out. So um, if you get nothing from this sermon, I bet you will learn something here that you'll remember. And that is the truth about how flight actually works. So here's this video that explains how that works. Oh, I went past it. Will it go? Will it go? <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's going. I'm just... Oh, yours is working much better than mine. i got to get off my screen and mine doesn't work. Okay, so this... Okay, it's in flight. So airflow, and then there's lift and, and gravity, which pulls down, and then there's thrust and drag. So you got these four basic principles. But what you're going to see next is actually what makes a plane fly, and this has, is about airflow, and it's called Bernoulli's Principle, and that's about low pressure, high pressure, and the speed of the air. So lift is achieved through the wing when you have that difference in air pressure, and that's Bernoulli's Principle. Fast moving air has lower pressure, air moving slower underneath. So when you've got the wing working proper, then you've got thrust and drag in proportion you have flight. So it works. You can count on it. There's probably a thousand planes in the air right now. You're safer in a plane than a car, which is weird, because a tin can 35,000 feet seems a little scary. But they have a marvelous record of, of safety because they're relying on truth in accordance with reality. Bernoulli's principle worked. The symbol thing was never going to work. It just didn't have it. But there is truth in this idea of this principle of airflow, and that's why. So next time you fly, I give you the gift of that. You can just turn to the person next to you and go, do you know Bernoulli's principle? And they'll say, no, I don't, likely. And then you can explain it and say, go back to your peanuts, you're welcome. But that, that's something you can count on, right? But then there's something called cognitive dissonance, which I'm fascinated by. And that is that we, we, we're taught something, we think something, like the guy who thought the, the bird would work, and then they said, Earl, it's never gonna work. But we think things, and then we learn something new that challenges what we've thought, and then that makes it difficult. So that's what cognitive dissonance is, the mental conflict that occurs when beliefs or assumptions are contradicted by new information. And this is a real challenge for us. How do we, how do we I talk about true and false narratives, but, but how do we sort of come to rely on that which we can really count on? My favorite example of cognitive dissonance is this fella. Anybody know what this guy is here? I bet most of you know. Who is it? Ponxatani Phil. Somebody decided, I'd love to have been at that meeting, but somebody decided that if we take a groundhog out on February 2nd and he sees his shadow, what is it? We get six weeks of winter? Is that what it is? And if he doesn't, we don't? I'm not really sure. But we tune in. You know, we're like, hey, what happened to Phil? Did he see it? <laughs> ah, darn, six more weeks. Let me just say this. This is a bad way to do meteorology. <laughs> it's just, it's just never, you don't want to build your, your whole weather system on that. Yeah, I saw the shadow. Yeah, we're in trouble. Cognitive dissonance is something we wrestle with because we have to figure out what is truth about things. And so what's happened in our day, particularly in the last 75 years, is we've ceded knowledge about truth to the academy, to the universities. And we say, well, they have the knowledge. And, they, and then, and then the, the academics go, but you guys in the church have faith. We'll let you guys have faith. That's, have fun with that. But I say this, we know things in the church that the academy simply can't explain and, and doesn't even try for the most part. And that's fine. But we're dealing with truths at a very deep level about human nature and human existence. And the scriptures that were read today are opening call to worship in Psalm 1 and then Jeremiah 
chapter 17 and in Luke 6, what we call the Sermon on the Plain, there's a thread that runs through all three, and it has to do with blessed is the person who does this, and conversely, cursed is the person or the life that goes this other way. So let's look at the two ways. First is from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in its season. Memorize Psalm 1 a long time ago. It's great truth in Psalm 1. What it's basically saying is there's two ways. There's one way. You can choose to take the counsel or advice of a person or persons who basically said, we call it the ungodly, there's no God, I'm going to figure this out in my own human way. I, ungodly literally means against God. And there are people who are against God, and they have counsel about what makes life right, what the good life is, and that sort of thing. So the psalmist is right away in Psalm 1 saying, yeah, blessed is the person who doesn't go that way. If you go that way, your mind is going to be filled with these things. Your narratives are going to be wrong. But in contrast, the person who delights in the law of the Lord, which I, I refer to God's will, God's way, or those of you know I like talking about things above, setting your mind on, and your hearts on things above, or the kingdom. The person who goes that way, that person is going to be like a tree planted by streams of water. A tree planted by water has constant sustenance energy and strength so that outward conditions like drought don't affect it. They, they're strong. They grow. So the psalmist is using a simile. This person is like this. This is what it's like. Telling us a truth. The person who goes the other way are like chaff compared to the wheat. They're hollow. They're nothing. They blow away when the wind comes because there's no substance. That's the kind of life that results from following the counsel of the ungodly. Jeremiah is going to say essentially the same thing. In this case, cursed be or woe be to those who trust in flesh. Flesh now doesn't mean your body. It means a life disconnected from God. Human energy, human resources apart from God. So if you say, I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to trust in my own ingenuity or creativity or intellect or what I'm going to figure this out on my own then that that the person who goes that way Jeremiah is saying that person is going to be like a shrub in the desert they don't have the resources and the sustenance they're just hanging on in contrast the person who trusts in God who puts their confidence in God is again like the tree planted by the stream same as Psalm 1 then we get to the New Testament in our gospel lesson and then Jesus is saying the same thing in what we call the, the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain in Luke is different than the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is much longer. The Sermon on the Mount is much deeper. The Sermon on the Plain shorter and a little meaner. Because <laughs> in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. In the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor. Hard to pretty that up. It's like, whoa, that's a shocking word. Really? That's against what we have been taught. And then in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus adds the woe bees. Woe be unto you who trust in your riches. Woe be unto you who's, who are full now. Woe be unto you who are happy and rejoicing. Woe be to you who trust in your reputation. Now I have to pause there to, because there's a tendency for us to read the Scriptures literally. And I, I often say to my students, if you try to read the Bible literally, <laughs> you're not understanding that it's literature, meaning that there's different types. And Jesus is, in, in the Sermon on the Plain, is not literally saying, if you have money, or eat a nice meal, or people think you're a good person, or you're generally happy, that you are cursed. He's saying, if you're putting all your trust, your whole life, you're building a life on those things then it's never going to amount to anything. In contrast, the person who's poor, the person who's hungry, the person who's mourning, the person who's being persecuted, that person is in a, in a condition to put their confidence in God. 
Jesus just, he knows that. He's brilliant. He knows that's the temptation. Again, he's not saying you're blessed because you're poor, hungry, mourning, and being persecuted. He's just saying you're in a condition where you can find that where? In the kingdom. In the kingdom. It's not in the condition. It's in the position. The person's in a position for that. So what do we know? We know that, and I just want to say this, Jesus is not being mean. Any, any more than it would be mean to, to tell the guy with the symbol, that's not going to work. You're not being mean. You're telling the truth. And Jesus is just telling us the truth because those ways, which would be money, material possessions, and reputation, have been tried and found wanting. They're batting zero. No one has ever found those things and went, this is great, this is, this is what I want. At one point, Madonna was the richest woman in the world. She had incredible fame. The world was crazy about her. So she had the big three, money, sex, power. And she, there was a documentary done about her. And in this documentary, she's asked by this person, it's in this kind of quiet moment, she's alone in this dressing room, and this guy says, so are you happy? And she says, no, I'm terribly unhappy. And so are all the people in my circle. Was that because she was suffering from something? No, because she was trying to build a life on that. And it, it can't work. It simply can't work. It's not being mean. It's just you're naming reality. So how do you find that kind of life that is the blessed life? You know, one of the most memorized passages of Scripture, next to probably John 3.16, is John 8.32. In John 8.32, we have these words, and the truth shall, I bet you can finish it, make you free or set you free. People love that little phrase. I've seen it on several college campuses, like non-Christian state college campuses. One, one university where it was a state college, I was there, and I went into an elevator, and it was right there on the elevator. The truth shall make you free. At least they did say John 8, 32, so they gave Jesus credit. But that idea is something we're drawn to. Like, yeah, the truth will make you free. And here's what I say. You can't understand John 8, 32 unless you understand John 8, 31. And this is what he's saying in 8, 32. If you continue in my word... What does that mean? Well, Jeff's been talking about disciples and rabbis. And so rabbis taught the disciples. And the disciples knew, I'm, I'm supposed to do the things my rabbi teaches. So Jesus is saying, if you continue in my teachings, then you're my disciple. And that's obvious. You can't be a disciple and not follow the teaching. So if you continue in my teaching, and you, then you'll be my disciple. Then you'll know the truth. Then the truth will set you free. Truth is not some nebulous thing floating out there in the ether that we go, I'm going to find that and it's going to make me free. Truth is saying, no, I'm going to live into the teachings of Jesus and when I do, then I'll find the freedom. Then I'll find that which I'm looking for. Now, we do have to be careful because this isn't something that's outward. Uh, it's easy to turn Jesus' teachings into legalism. As I said earlier, to go, well, he said... You know, cursed are the rich, so I better sell everything. And cursed are those who are full, well, I better go starve. And cursed are those who laugh, I better not laugh again. Cursed are those who have people think well of you, that's, well, I'm going to see if I can go out and get persecuted and mourn today. No, the spirit of Jesus' teaching is, don't put your confidence in those things. And Jesus always taught that it's a matter of the inside coming out a good tree bears good fruit. Make the tree good, and good fruit will come from it. What's inside comes out. So the spirit of Jesus' teaching is saying, I understand what he's saying. And we're going to look at some of his teachings in a minute, what that consists of. But it's an inward change of heart that results in outward lifestyle. We want to stay always away from legalism. Always away from legalism. Dallas Willard once told me that he felt God called him to a ministry to wealthy people. And I said, well, why? And he said, because 
God has brought many wealthy people to me in my life, and I discovered they're full of guilt. They feel guilty for being rich. I said, well, what's your ministry to them? He said, my ministry is to tell them, don't feel guilty about it. You've been given this resource, but don't trust it. Don't try to build your happiness on it and use it for kingdom good. So you stay away from legalism and do stay with the spirit of it because the spirit, once it's in, it comes out in appropriate ways. Because that's the way it works. Um, several years ago now, I was, I, I was hosting a guy. He came in to speak on our campus and I took him to dinner and we had this lovely dinner and then I went home and I was a little bit late I crawled into bed, 10.30 or whatever it was, and Megan was in bed, my wife, she was there. And, but I got in bed, and it didn't take long, maybe two minutes, and she just went, what did you eat? And I said, uh, roast beef? What else did you eat? Well, the, the, these potatoes, these, these little potatoes. She said, describe the potatoes. I said, they were, they were, li- they were small. I'd never seen potatoes this small. And they were cooked in butter. They were really good. She said, Jim, Those were garlic cloves. (laughs) She said, how many did you eat? I said, a dozen? And she she went, yeah, out of of bed. So I was on the couch that night. (laughs) Next day we go to chapel, and and she comes in, she sits down next to me in chapel, she goes, whatever you're doing is not working. (laughs) I was like, well, I can't help it. It's inside me. I can't brush it away. It's inside. It's going to come out, right? And that, that's Jesus' teaching is you want to get your heart. He wasn't teaching about garlic. But it, what's inside comes out. That's the nature of it. So we want to take his teaching, the spirit of it, and live into that. And the spirit is don't put your confidence in these things. Instead, put your confidence in the kingdom. And that will make the difference. That's how we were designed. So what did Jesus teach? Well, it's not hard to realize what he taught. He taught things like love one another. Has that ever not worked? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No one's ever tried that and went, yeah, that one's not working. It actually is batting a thousand. Don't judge. Now, I want to be careful here because then you can get legalists and go, well, what do you mean by that? I'm not saying don't offer critique. I'm a professor. I grade... 50 papers a week. I'm judging them in one sense, but when, when Jesus says don't judge, what he means is, is looking at a person and saying, you are worthless. It's about shame. It's judging the person's being, not their actions. We judge actions, but that's what he means. And so judging has never actually helped anybody. Love your enemies. Turns out that's better than being violent. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything will be added. Nobody's tried it and went, didn't work. Abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branch. Spend time with me. Connect with me. Stay connected with me. You'll bear fruit. It it works every time. That's why I I chose for our opening hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour, Most Precious Lord. I love that hymn. I play it a lot. I need Jesus every hour because that's how we were designed. Well, what does blessing mean? Because we're talking about the path to blessedness. Blessed means three things biblically. One, it means to have the affirmation of God on our lives. You know, uh, one of the most beautiful things for a a Sabbath for a Jewish family is when the father blesses the children, goes to each child and says a blessing upon them. And so what, what this means, whether it's in the Psalm, Jeremiah, is to say, when you're living this way, God loves you. Get over that. You're not earning it. But when you're doing that, God is he's saying, I bless that. I bless that. That's a good way to go. Second, it means that we have inner joy. That's a natural reaction. That's what that life produces. It's hard. It's hard to do. But it's, it is the path to joy. And third, it's, we're right inside. That's, we were designed for that. So I know that if this week I spend some time doing to others as I would want them to do to me, my insides are right. My soul is right. That's what blessedness means. I began with an illustration of flight, and you know our 
technology has advanced so much now that we've got these jets that can fly so fast that it's very difficult for the pilots to fly them. And at the beginning of the Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard begins with this story. I know that's way too small for you to see, but I'll read it. Recently, a pilot was practicing high-speed maneuvers in a jet fighter. She turned the controls for what she thought was a, a steep ascent and flew straight into the ground. She was unaware that she was flying upside down. This is a parable of human existence in our times. Not exactly that everybody's crashing, though there's enough of that. But most of us as individuals and world society as a whole live at a high speed and often with no clue to whether we're flying upside down or right side up. Indeed, we're haunted by a strong suspicion that there may be no difference, or at least it is unknown or irrelevant. What we know about that pilot is that if you trust in your inner ear, like I was speaking in between services to Colonel Gary Reed, he's a, he's a jet pilot, and he was explaining that what happens is when you're flying, he said many times when I'm flying at a high speed, I don't know if I'm upside down or right side down on the basis of my inner ear. But I trust my instruments because my instruments don't lie. And what happened in her situation was she was trusting her inner ear. She thought she was right side up, but she was upside down. And the point of it is, is that if we take our own selves as our moral compass, we're likely to crash. We need something bigger. We need something truer. We need something ancient to tell us what this truth is. In his great poem, The Road Not Taken, Robert Frost writes these well-known words. I shall be telling with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that's made all the difference. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, narrow is the way that leads to life. He wasn't being mean when he said, broad is the way that leads to perdition. The more traveled road is the one where we try to go on our own. The road less traveled is the one where we surrender and follow his will, his way, and set our minds on things above. But it makes all the difference. You may be saying, well, you know, we, we have a lot of messages of grace and love at Chapel Hill. Jim was pretty strong today. I mean, he was challenging us with that. Let me just say this. You know, some weeks back I quoted Scott McKnight and his uh, definition of, of God's love. He said, God's love is a rugged commitment to be with us, for us, and unto our wholeness because God delights in us. If, if you love somebody, you want their best. You don't just go, well, I love you and wreck your life. God's love, which is essential and central, is also God's desire for us to live a life of blessedness. Not because he won't love us if we don't, but because God wants what's best. If people say, you know, what, what is it that, that's unique about Chapel Hill? Is there anything that, that stands out about, about Chapel Hill? I say this. I say, at Chapel Hill, we have a message of grace and a method of discipleship. From the very beginning, I believe God brought Jeff and I together 23 years ago because we were both convinced of the unconditional love of God. that in Christ, all of our sins, past, present, and future, had been dealt with. The finality of the cross, the reality of the resurrection, this notion that we're God's beloved on our worst day, that we can take off our masks and be real, that drew us together, and that's what this church was founded on. And along the way, we also believed there was a method of discipleship. I mean, we're Methodists. That wasn't a joke. We ha yeah, every, everybody has to have a method, and we believe there's a method for growth, a, a, a reliable pattern to grow. And it was at this church that we built what became the Apprentice Series. And I'm looking at a bunch of you, and you went through it. You signed up for 30 days of an intense discipleship journey, and lives were changed. And from that experience, that series is now in about 16 languages and has impacted the globe. Chapel Hill, that's where it happened. This is a place where you're going to hear a message of grace and learn a method of discipleship and growth. That's the challenge, to be open to that message, to be open to the challenge 
of where God wants to take us. So let's enter into a time of, of silent reflection and, and be listening to the Spirit. What is God calling me to do today?